The Lord detects dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favour with him. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless makes their path straight, but the wicked are brought down by their own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the unfaithful are trapped by evil desires. Hopes placed in mortals die with them. All the promises of their power comes to nothing. The righteous person is rescued from trouble and it falls on the wicked instead. With their mouths, the godless destroy their neighbours, but through knowledge, the righteous escape. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. Good morning. Oh, it's so nice to see people's faces. Welcome. Um, if you've been joining us at Upton Vale during this summer, you will know that we've been spending some time thinking about some pretty big questions. How to be wise, how to be rich, how not to worry and how to live life to the full, to name just a few. And in helping us ponder these questions, we've been using the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament of the Bible. What's the book of Proverbs? Well, Proverbs was written, uh, uh, probably written by Solomon, we think, the son of King David, and himself a king, the king of Israel between about 971 and 930 BC, a king famous for being wise. And the book of Proverbs, as we've just heard, beautifully read, thank you, um, is full of these pithy little sayings and instructions. Um, that as Proverbs 1 verse 3 tells us, the purpose of which is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. And verse four, helping people do what is right, what is just, and what is fair. The book of Proverbs is all about being wise, a theme that we've constantly come back to over this summer series. And being wise, it seems, is not only knowing and understanding something, head knowledge, but it's putting it into practice. It has to have practical application. I've given an example of this. Let, 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 let's give another example. Uh, you meet someone who knows everything there is to know about tigers. Okay? They know what tigers eat, what their natural habitat is, how long they live for, how many are still in the wild. They might know all the different kinds of species of tigers there are. They might have all this head knowledge. But if they then go and put their hand into a tiger's cage, they're probably not being wise. The book of Proverbs is more than a book about knowledge. The book of Proverbs is a book about wisdom. And wisdom is putting head knowledge into practice. So, as we continue our series on Proverbs this morning, we're going to turn uh, to this passage, Proverbs 11, 1 to 11, and do have a look at it as I go through it this morning. We're going to take a look at this question, how to improve the community that we live in? How to improve the community that we live in? And I'd like to break this down into three parts. Firstly, part one. What does this book of Proverbs say about the how? Simply, how is community improved? Secondly, I'd like to look at the result. What happens when community is improved? And thirdly, I'd like to think a little bit more widely about the point of it all. For those of us uh, listening here this morning that are Christians, that have already decided to follow Jesus to make him king of our lives, is improving the community that we find ourselves in, something that we should be passionate about? Is this something that God in the Bible asks us to do? So, that's a simple map of the journey I'd like to take us on this morning. But before we start, I wonder if there are some people 
listening right now, maybe that aren't yet part of the Christian community, maybe exploring about what a Jesus follower is, who are simply asking, how dare you? Who do you think you are to talk about improving the community you live in? What makes you Christians think that you're any better? What gives the church the right to have the answers? You might even be thinking, typical Christians always looking down on other people. Let me sidestep that question for a moment and simply ask this one in return. Is our community that we live in in need of improvement? Does our community need change? I was was born and bred here in sunny Torquay, the English Riviera. I love this town. Um, So much so that seven years ago, I, I moved back to it. But is Torquay a community that doesn't need any change? A recent local news report highlighted the following statistics. Crime, and in particular, violent crime here in the Bay, is above the national average. There are higher than average levels of alcohol-related admissions to hospital. There are higher than average levels of vulnerability within our local population. And there are higher than average levels of mental ill health. The number of children looked after by our our local authority remains one of the two highest in the whole country, second only to Blackpool. Can we all agree this morning that the communities that we live in could do with change? So with this starting point then, with this knowledge that our communities, the places that we live in, we go to work in, we meet our friends in, we bring our children up in, could do with change, let's explore together what Proverbs this book of wisdom says about how to improve our community. And so let's get right to the detail right away. Let's look at the how. What does Proverbs say about the mechanics of how a community can change? As I explained a few weeks ago when we looked at Proverbs 3 together, the book of Proverbs is part of the wisdom and poetry literature of the Bible. And this is really important to know because just like a poem, the form of how Proverbs is put together, the pattern of the words, the way they're shaped, all that helps us understand more clearly what the writer is telling us. And in Proverbs 11, we find that the writer begins the chapter by laying foundations. In verses 1 to 9, if we look at them, we learn of three virtues, of three character traits that the writer believes are lived out by people who are wise. And then, in verse 10 and 11, we see the effect of those virtues on the whole community. Verse 11, through wise people living out these character traits, what happens? A city is exalted. So, what are these three character traits? Well, the first one is this, righteousness. Look at verse 5. The righteousness of the blameless makes their path straight, but the wicked are brought down by their own wickedness. Look at verse 6. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the unfaithful are trapped by evil desires. And verse 8. The righteous person is rescued from trouble, and it falls on the wicked instead. The writer of Proverbs make it clear there's something really important here about this idea of righteousness. But what does it even mean? It's a word we seem to band around a lot in churches, but it isn't really used anywhere else, is it? How are you? I'm feeling pretty righteous today. Thank you very much. The Hebrew word used here that we translate as righteousness is a word that means being right with God. It carries with it this this idea of living under the laws of a king. And so our understanding here in biblical context is of living life under God's kingly instructions rather than living under our own ideas. And if we look at verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 8, we see that when we live our lives that way, then our paths will be straight, verse 5. That we don't get trapped, verse 6, and we stay clear of trouble, verse 8. Proverb makes it clear that being righteous 
following God's laws is good for us. This seems to be a big secret. I touched this on a few weeks ago. Somehow we've decided as human beings that God's instructions for our lives are there to show how dedicated we are in following him. They're there to make our lives hard. They're there to stop us having fun. They're there for us to prove our worth. But the big secret is, is that God's instructions are there because they're the best way for us to live our lives. God loves us. He wants the best for us. And his instructions for living laid out in the Bible enable us to do that. Let me give you one small example. Matthew 6, verse 34 says this. Jesus gives this God instruction. He says, do not worry. Okay? God wants us to rely on him and not worry. He doesn't want us to stress about tomorrow. Why? Is it because God wants to have all the power? Is it because God wants us to make our lives hard? No. God doesn't want us to worry because he knows the worrying is the, the not worrying is the best way to live our lives. Listen to this. A recent health leaflet issued by the government pinpoints anxiety, worrying, as a major factor in the increase of health problems. And it lists the following as possible effects of worry. Difficulty making decisions, inability to concentrate, confusion, seeing only the negative, repetitive, repetitive or racing thoughts, poor judgment, loss of objectivity, memory problems, moodiness, hypersensitivity, restlessness, anxiety, depression, anger, resentment, easily irritated, on edge, sense of being overwhelmed, lack of confidence, headaches, digestive problems, muscle tension, pain, sleep disturbances, fatigue, chest pain, irregular heartbeat, high blood pressure, weight gain or loss, asthma, shortness of breath, skin problems, eating more or less, sleeping too much, too little, isolating yourselves from others, overreacting to unexpected problems, neglecting your responsibilities, no nervous habits, teeth grinding, jaw clenching, overdoing activities such as exercise or shopping, or losing your temper. Why do God's instructions tell us not to worry about tomorrow? Why does God say, don't try and do things in your own strength, but instead trust in me? It's because he loves us. And his instructions for our lives are good. But this is the really interesting thing, the thing that as church, as God followers, I think we sometimes get wrong. Notice the Proverbs doesn't say God's rules are good and therefore go out into your community and enforce those rules on the people around you. Look carefully at verses 10 and 11. Verse 10, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. And verse 11, through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. The writer doesn't say, when the city is made to follow God's instructions, the city is exalted. It's when God's followers, the righteous, follow God's instructions that the city rejoices. I think this is a really hard thing to get our brains around because if we decide to follow Jesus... If we care for people and love people, then we really want them to live by God's instructions because we know it's the best for them. But until someone meets God, has a relationship with God, trusts God, they're not going to want to live by his instructions. And the Bible does not tell us to force these instructions on our community. It's like, okay, I love table tennis. And I've introduced this uh, sport to my daughter, Bethany. If I'd sat down at the start and given Bethany all the rules for professional table tennis, do you know what? She would not have cared less. In fact, it'd have done worse. It would have put her off playing table tennis. I can imagine. Now, table tennis, Bethany, is a great game. When you start a point, you have to, uh, you have to serve, and you serve by holding the ball in the flat palm of your hand, Bethany. It can't be below the level of the table at any point, and then you must throw that ball upwards by at least 15 centimetres before you strike it for the first time. Thanks, Dad, but I think I'll go and watch TV instead. No. Instead, I introduce Bethany to the game. We just hit the ball back and forth. She's gradually grown to love playing it, and now she's got to the point when she wants to know the rules. They make sense to her. 
She realizes why they're there, and she wants to play by them. It's the best way to play table tennis, yes. But the rules can't come first. Proverbs 11 says, if you want to be a positive influence in your community, firstly, you need to be righteous. You don't force God rules on the community, but as a God follower, you live yourself by God's great instructions. So that's the first. That's the longest, don't fret. Secondly, humility. If the first character trait is righteousness, the second is this. The the God follower needs to show humility. Look with me at Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. What does humility mean? Well, the clue's in the same, uh, the same passage there. Look at verse 7. Hope placed in mortals die with them, or the promise of that power comes to nothing. The writer of Proverbs is giving us a clue here to humility. Humility is realizing it's not about what we can do, about how we behave, what we can achieve. If we simply rely on our own efforts, we're doomed to failure. Verse 7, hope placed in mortals, in human beings, it dies with them. Humility is about putting ourselves lower and raising others higher because we know it's all about God and not us. As God followers, the Bible tells us, we can only begin to live by God's instructions because he's with us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he helps us day by day to do so. And it's in this knowledge that we live humbly, not despising ourselves, but loving God and loving our neighbours first and foremost. You want to improve your community, the writer of Proverbs tells us. You need to live righteously. You need to live righteously. You need to live humbly. And the third building block, you need to live with integrity. Look at verse 3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. What does integrity mean? Well, the clue is in verse 1. The Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights, they find favor with him. In the ancient Near East, a pair of weighing scales would have looked a bit like this. Merchants would have used them to buy and sell goods, and on one side you'd put your true weights, your standard for how heavy something is, and on the other side you would put your merchandise that you were buying or selling. Now the honest merchant would use the standard weight for everything they did, but the dishonest merchant, they would use a heavier weight to sell their goods, to make more money, and a lighter way to buy their goods. The standard wouldn't be true. It wouldn't be fair. And the writer of Proverbs says, if you want to change a community, you must live your life by the one true standard. What we say, what we believe, what we do, it all has to be aligned. It has to match each other. We can't use the standard for one thing and then another standard for something else. We have to show integrity. That's true wisdom. So verses 1 to 9, how can a community be changed? If we choose to follow God, then in our workplaces, in our homes, in our schools, in our relationships, we need to live righteously. We need to live humbly. And we need to live with integrity. As a quick aside, by the way, I find it fascinating that the three biggest charges I hear against Christians in our culture is that Christians think that they're better than their community, that Christians are hypocrites, and that Christians enforce their way of living on the world around them. How fascinating, then, that nearly 3,000 years ago, the writer of in Proverbs instructs God's followers to live righteously to live humbly, and to live with integrity. So what's the result? If this is how a community can be changed, what is the result of a community being changed? What happens to that community? Well, if you look at verse 10, we hear that the city rejoices. 
There's an actual feeling of joy in the community. This word literally means jumping with enthusiasm. And in verse 11, we read this. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. The word here translated as exalted uh, from the Hebrew is the word room. And it means to be promoted, to be raised, to be lifted. It's used to describe a process where something is physically heaved up and raised higher. That's the effect that a wise God follower can have on the community around them. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that worthy of prayer that we as individuals, as a church, can lift up the community around us? That we can heave up our town in a way that could cause people to jump with joy. So what does this look like in reality? In my first year of university, I lived in a halls of residence, like a purpose-built mini-community. And I have to admit that I spent much of my first year just trying to fit in with the crowd, trying to distance myself from my faith. And just down my corridor lived a guy called Nick, who ended up being a really good friend of mine. And Nick was a guy that I believed lived out this wisdom of Proverbs 11. He's a guy who, who lives his life in righteousness, but also in humility and with integrity. And one night, um, some girls who I considered uh, good friends of mine were messing around with stuff they, they, they shouldn't have been. They were messing around with a Ouija board. And I don't know what happened, but they got really spooked. And so at 2 a.m., they came down the stairs onto my corridor. And they walked along my corridor, and they got to my room, and then they walked right on past, and they knocked on Nick's door. And Nick got up, and he calmed them down, and he gave them a cup of tea, and he chatted, and he prayed with them. And as the year went on, and as I was continuing to try and fit in myself, I noticed that these girls weren't the only ones to come and knock on my friend Nick's door, to have a cup of tea and a biscuit, to have a chat and sometimes a pray with my friend Nick. We went to my second year and we moved out of halls. And um, it wasn't my choice, but I ended up living in a house with Nick and six other guys. And just like his room in the halls of residence, I found our house became a place where people were constantly dropping in. Foreign students trying to find their feet in a new city. A guy struggling with mental health issues. At one point, a homeless person simply seeking shelter from the weather. And each time, there would be tea and coffee and chat, and help, and prayer, and laughter, and joy. And I believe, just as the writer of Proverbs describes, the community around us was heaved up higher. How do we improve community? We live righteously, we live humbly, and we live with integrity. Now part of me wants to stop this morning right here. Some of you might be thinking, yes please, You've been going on long enough. But there's a, there's a question that I must admit that I wrestle with as I look at this passage in Proverbs 11. And perhaps I wonder other people too. The question is probably mainly for those listening this morning that are Christians. They have already decided to make God king of their lives. And the question is this. Is improving the community around us a priority for Christians? You see, if we're Christians, we believe that Jesus died and rose again to pay the punishment for the things we've done wrong. We believe that Jesus is therefore the only way to heaven. He is, as John 14 says, the way, the truth, and the life. And we're therefore called by the great uh, commission to tell people the truth. As a Christian, I have a burning desire for people to know Jesus, to tell them about Jesus. And as Paul writes in the New Testament, life in this world is nothing compared to the eternity that is to come. Philippians 3 verse 7 says this, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Surely, this world doesn't really matter anymore. Christians don't need to be improving their community. All they need to be doing is telling people about Jesus. As I, as I wrestle with this, I think the clue to answering this question is found in the very foundation of Proverbs 11. We've looked at it once already. Verse 1. The Lord detests dishonest scales, 
but accurate weights finds favour with him. The writer of Proverbs tells us that wisdom is living with our whole life aligned. Wisdom is not just knowing it, it's living out. If we truly believed that God loved the whole world so much, he was willing himself to come down from heaven and live in it as the person of Jesus and then die for it to save it, then, hey everyone, we've got to love it too. Being a God follower is, is living a life of righteousness, of humility, and of integrity. And yes, that means having a passionate desire to tell people about Jesus, to spread the good news of who he is and what he's done, to introduce people to the sustainer and saviour of the universe. But being a God follower, living our lives aligned, ensuring that our scales are honest, also means desiring to heave up this community around us wherever we are and to bring joy to the city. I want to finish by uh, praying for each and every one of us listening this morning, wherever we are, both as individuals and as a church. And also let us, whilst we're doing that, pray for the communities around us. I believe that this time, we've talked already so much about the effect of of COVID and this strange life that we are living right now. I believe this time more than ever, our community needs joy and our community needs to be heaved up. So I ask you now, and please don't feel like you have to in any way, this is not for the people around us, this is between you and God. That if you want to be part of that, if you have a desire inside yourself to heave up this community around us, that as we pray now, whether you're at home watching or you're here at Upton Vale, let's stand. Let's stand together and pray this prayer. If this is for you, stand now. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to live righteously. Help us to love and live humbly, and help us to live with integrity as followers of you. In the power of your Holy Spirit, align our lives so that we live by honest scales, that our head knowledge matches our actions, matches our relationship with you. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray now for our communities, that not by our power, but by yours, that our schools, that our homes, that our workplaces are heaved up, are lifted higher. Lord Jesus, help us bring your joy to this city. Amen.